let me start by saying, as an Egyptian, I, with 7,000 years of history behind us, uh, we're used to living in a region that has a large number of challenges and a large number of opportunities at the same time. What is different now is, on the one hand, the world is so much smaller, and therefore everything that's happening around the region is also being fed into the region, into our own mindset, into how we calibrate our opinions, how we compare our achievements to others or our failures to others. And what's also changed is we're having all these problems or all these challenges at the same time. A number of very serious issues all have come at the same time, and it's mind-boggling even for a country with 7,000 years of history. A couple of points. I don't need to make, this, make them here in this kind of audience, but, but I will because I, I've tended to make them with most American public audiences. I think while most foreigners tend to look at the Middle East and either see the Arab-Israeli conflict or oil, it's important to understand there's more to it than that. That's why it's more complex, that's why it's more challenging, uh, and that's why there are more opportunities than simply uh, whether we produce oil or whether we can solve the Arab-Israeli conflict. Strategically, by where we're situated, especially in the case of my country, Africa, we're actually the only country that has territory both in Africa and Asia, uh, a link between Europe and, and the East. Uh, the Middle East spreads from Morocco on the Atlantic right through uh, into the Persian Gulf. So it's, it's located in a very strategic, important area. Whether you're interested in uh, maritime commerce, security lanes, or the political issues that we face in energy. I'd add to it that while it tends to be homogeneous, it's not identical in all the countries. Most of the Middle East, out of about 300 million, most of it, are Arabs. Most of them are Muslims. But there is a Christian community, again, in my, co my country alone, we have about 10% Christian community, Copts and, and uh, Catholics and, and um, other disciplines. And there are a number of Jews also, and there are different Muslims as well, between Shiites and Sunnis and so on. And frankly, the Middle Easterners in the Maghreb, in the, in the North African Maghreb, uh, have a historical experience that is much closer linked to Europe than the Middle Easterners in the Gulf area, or that, for example, my own country, Egypt in the center. And that defines how they define themselves. I'm making these points because, the, in my mind, the greatest challenge the Middle East faces today is defining its identity. We've, defined, we've been defined more often than not either only by the fact that we speak, most of us speak Arabic, or by how you see us rather than who we are. And frankly, in a global society today where all of our uh, commonality and all of our differences are magnified, we as Middle Easterners are challenged to determine exactly who we are. In the beginning of the Egyptian revolution, there was a huge tide of Arab nationalism, uh, an era where we saw decolonization from European colonization, and which extended to, throughout the Middle East into Africa and, and well beyond. And it was very easy for a Middle Eastern to say, I'm an Arab, at least most of us did, and we understood who we were. With if, I don't want to say the demise of Arab nationalism because I think it still exists, but with the success of the decolonization process, the, 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 swan, the, uh, uh, the main force behind Arab nationalism has in many ways decreased and Middle Easterners today are looking for a different way to define themselves. 
one of the reasons why it's so difficult for us, we are a changing region. I often joke that Egypt, and it's correct actually, is 7,000 years old, and Americans tend to look at us as an old country. But we have an extremely young population. 56% of our population is 25 years or younger. 25% of everybody living in the Middle East lives in Egypt. About 300 million uh, Middle Easterners. Of those 300 million, 76 million live in Egypt. So for any young generation, it is natural for them to try to search for their role in life, their place in life, their identity. And this generation is facing a situation where they're not linked to Arab nationalism, but they're Arabs because that's the main language that, they, that they've used. Uh, and that's been part of most of their history. They're looking in a much more global context towards the world. The Middle East is also the birthplace of the three uh, monotheistic religions. So religion is a very big issue in our part of the world. And consequently, as many of you have followed, one of the, uh, the, 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 the ways people identify themselves now is, well, are we Muslim or are we Christian or are we Jewish? Are we Shiite or are we Sunni? Even further than that, and I can go on and say Allah, we can, we can go on and on about who's what. This is another issue that has come up and become very prominent in trying to determine uh, who we are. So our greatest challenge, frankly, is determining who we are and what role we will play in the international community. And I'm making this last point because as the search for identity emerged, two basic trends also emerged. One calling for going back to the fundamentals, which is basically going back to our core, going back to our faith, and falling back on that. And another trend which felt we want to actually join the modern world and be Western, or I'm simplifying it, be modern, which was another way of saying we want to be Western rather than be Arab. So you have this uh, challenge that we're facing between in the search for identity, do we go back to our fundamentals and try to emphasize who we are in our own region, or do we go out and try to become somebody who we are not? My answer to this, frankly, is a bit different. I think it's important for us to engage the world, but to engage the world with our own values, our own issues, our own experiences, be more progressive, active players in the international agenda, rather than trying to be more French, more Italian, more American, uh, or more Chinese. Uh, and that's really, again, a challenge that we're facing in our part of the world. Now, to have the tools to do what I'm suggesting, one of the practical challenges is economic and social development. You're not going to be able to be an effective player worldwide unless you are an economic and social force over and above the military aspect of all of that. But I don't think a military force is sustainable long term if you don't have an economic and social background. So again, a major challenge will be, can we move from being underdeveloped countries to developing countries to developed countries? And as we do that, engage in economic and social development and put forward our agenda to the world as, as, as a whole. 